So this paper was written May 7th, 2017. Time travel in the thousand piece jigsaw puzzle with stellar metamorphosis. Here, my brain was uh, almost three years ago, it's 2020. We live in the future now. I cut and paste this little, st these statements here, I'll read them out to you and I'll explain why they're wrong, more or less. But they actually come from a mind that makes assumptions about the world around them and refuses to look outside of themselves for answers that have already been, or, you know, solved, I guess. Questions that have already been answered, I guess. Our understanding of the origin and evolution of the solar system is still very limited. Ideas about how the solar system formed are still not thoroughly tested. There is no single theory that explains it all. Progress is made by cycling through the scientific process of hypothesis, prediction, measurement, theory, hypothesis. So they have a little feedback loop. This is in the paper. The feedback loop, they say. They say to do science, you have to do the theory, hypothesis, prediction, measurement, theory, hypothesis, prediction, measurement. It seems like that's how you do science. That's the only way you can come to any reasonable conclusion about how the universe operates, how stars evolve, how plants form, how the natural world works. You can't figure it out unless you have this. That's a false worldview. You can figure things out without using the scientific process. You know how? Use your mind. You think about it. It's easy. Firstly, to use your mind, I don't know if any scientists are listening to this, you have to question your assumptions. Because remember, in this little feedback loop thing you got here where you say there's a theory, there's a hypothesis, there's a prediction, and there's a measurement. You're forgetting a fifth one. It's what you're assuming to be true about the world around you. There are ideas that you've accepted that are totally false. And no matter how much of this you do, you're just going in circles. You have to be able to question your assumptions about, the na about nature, about the world around you. If you can't do that, then no amount of the scientific process is going to help you. You're going to be lost. That being said, the assumptions stick out like a sore thumb. Our understanding of the origin and evolution of the solar system is still very limited. Okay, first thing, origin and evolution of the solar system. They're taking the solar system, all the objects in it, and they're assuming it's a complete unit. That all the objects inside the solar, the solar system, meaning all the objects that mostly orbit the sun, but the truth is most objects orbit the other objects like Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune. But they're saying that the solar system is all the objects that orbit around the sun, either directly or indirectly. And they're looking at it as a single unit. They're not looking at the objects as being independent structures that have different evolutionary histories, are vastly different ages, have different chemical compositions. They're not looking at them as, like I've phrased in another paper, a polymetamorphic system, meaning many stages of metamorphosis, in other words. And then they say, they use the, they use the big, uh, the we and the R and all that stuff. No, it's not me. They're not including me. And they say R to signal that they're the authorities in the matter. What they should be doing is say, saying my little group and what my little group believes or what I believe. But they don't do that. They try to make it an authoritative type statement. And then they say, still very limited. Boom, another assumption. They're assuming it's limited. It's not limited. Their view of the world around them is limited. Not mine. Not you guys's. You guys are learning how the earth evolved. That the stars evolved into what are called planets by the astronomers. <clears throat> and it says here, ideas about how the solar system formed are still not thoroughly tested. There is no single theory that explains it all. I can't remember who wrote this. Oh yeah, this is from University of Colorado, I believe. 
I have the link right here. And I put that in quotes. There is no single theory that explains it all. Sure, this isn't a theory that explains it all, but I come damn close. Check that out. The stars are born really hot and bright. They expand. They cool, shrink, and collapse and become what are called planets and exoplanets and moons. And if they evolve too fast, they become really small moons and asteroids and meteoroids and that kind of stuff. And they eventually will smash into each other, making smaller and smaller objects, which then get recycled back into the hotter, younger stars after they're born and come into being inside the galaxy. But they're not going to realize that this is how it actually works because... They're going in circles. They don't have any method for uh, questioning the assumptions they hold to be true about the world. And the assumptions, a few of them, are that Earth has remained the same size as it is, give or take a couple hundred billion tons of material. That the Earth has the same radiative output as it has now. It could never have been really bright and hot like the sun. Three, all the um, gas giants inside of our system could have never been large and hot and bright like the sun. Four, all the objects in the solar system are all the same age, even though they're all different ages. Five, the atmospheric uh, pressure, and this is a really basic one, the atmospheric pressure that we have right now at 1 ATM, which is, I think, um, there's another, there's, no, there's a few ways of describing atmospheric pressure. Uh, I think it's about 1.007 bar, and the Earth's atmospheric pressure couldn't have been 3 to 5 bar, which is about 3 to 5 atmospheric pressures, which, you know, I had talked previously, which would explain why dinosaurs' necks could be really long. I had linked that in another um, person's paper where they explained that, yeah, Earth's atmospheric pressure was higher in the past, significantly higher. That's why the dinosaurs could be so freaking huge. Their, that's why they could, their necks could go really long. And that's why really large flying dinosaurs could fly, because the air was a lot thicker. Uh, given the atmospheric pressure we have right now, if those really large flying dinosaurs that were the size of buses, you know, were around today, they would only be able to walk. They w probably wouldn't even be able to glide, really, because the air is too thin. But the Earth's uh, atmosphere back during the ages of the dinosaurs, like 65 to like around 250, 300 million years ago, was a lot thicker. And the further and further and further you go back in time, the thicker and thicker and thicker the atmosphere got until it reaches a point to where life didn't actually exist. Earth was a very toxic environment and it just got more toxic and toxic the further and further you go back into the point to where the elemental composition of the Earth was also different. So you had a lot more hydrogen, helium, and ox oxygen in the atmosphere, which wasn't actually combined with hydrogen yet to make water. And then you just expand out further and further and further, the further you go back in time. Eventually you get to the hottest, youngest Earths, which scientists call stars. And then the scientists say things like, we don't know what Earth looked like in its past. We have to, we have to do computer models. Of course, you know what Earths look like in the past. You see them in the sky at night. You call them stars. Those are young Earths. Those are really young, hot, couple million year old Earths. And as they cool and evolve, they lose their ability to, to shine, to radiate, and they collapse upon themselves gravitationally. And that gravitational potential energy is converted into kinetic energy and heat. And that heat eventually moves towards the central regions of the star, keeping the center warm and warm and warm as it evolves. And it can wander around interstellar space. And over time, that thick atmosphere starts dissipating, uh, revealing the giant rocky ball in the center called a planet. But we call it a planet, but they're all stars. They're all planets. It's the same, it's the same thing here. Um, to continue underneath their circular running around in circle reasoning here that doesn't allow them to question the assumptions that they're making they say uh, how do we explore the solar system's early history 
We cannot go back in time. It is a bit like trying to build a 1,000 piece jigsaw puzzle, it is written there, from the five pieces you find lying under the table after the cat has chewed them. It is not quite so bad if we, if we insist the solar system evolved according to the laws of physics and chemistry. This limits the set of all imaginable histories, but there is still a lot of guesswork to be tested before we can really talk about a real theory of solar system formation. Firstly, how do we explore the solar system's early history? You have to question the assumption you're making. The solar system isn't a single object. It's multiple objects in multiple different stages of evolution with multiple histories that are all rich in his, their, their histories are all rich. Very, very, very ancient histories. And the more energetic, the larger it is, as a rule of thumb, the younger it is. So if you want to look at the oldest objects in the solar system, you look at the objects that don't have radiative capacity like the sun. You look at objects that don't have huge storms on them like the great red spot on Jupiter. You don't look at the winds of Neptune which travel 2,000 miles an hour in the higher up, higher up atmosphere. You don't look at that and think that's an old star. No. You don't even look at the Earth because the Earth has volcanoes. The Earth has earthquakes. The Earth has hurricanes. It still has an atmosphere. If you want to look at the really, really, really old stars, even older than Venus, which I have it as four, about 450 billion years old, you look at things like the moon, which doesn't even have atmosphere. It's just a dead rock. Or Mercury, same thing. It has lots of craters in it. It's been wandering this galaxy, probably multiple galaxies in the past. Those are the dead stars. Those are what we should be studying if we want to really understand um, the vast history that we're referring to. Those objects are what Earth is going to become once the volcanoes release all the energy, once the mantle cools down inside the center of the Earth, and the Earth completely solidifies into a giant ball, and then the atmosphere eventually dissipates, and all life on it is gone. But, um, it's not, it's the solar system's early history. They, the astronomers, they have to look at it as being individual objects inside the solar system. Each individual object has its own history. So that's their first problem. Secondly, if you want to look at those objects, you have to put them in a longer scale that connects them all together on a similar path, but different because they have different evolutionary histories. And that's why uh, Baz and I made this diagram, is that it's not that you have the solar system as a single object, you have multiple different objects all over on this graph, they're all different ages. So the sun would be up here, you have Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus over here, Saturn's over here, Earth is over here, Venus is down here, Mercury is way over here, the moon's probably somewhere down here. They're all different. But their insistence on making them all the same age and then saying, well, how'd the solar system form? It's not a system, if you think about it. It's a temporary, it's a temporary construct. These objects are temporarily in orbit around each other. And we sort of kind of like, we should, we should have figured that out a long time ago when, you know, uh, Galileo was looking at the moons around Jupiter. We should have figured it out then. Like, listen, the Jupiter is its own star system. It has really close in planets to itself. So does Saturn. So does Neptune. So does Uranus. They all have their own moons, but we can really look at those as being their own planets. They're their own star systems in of themselves. They just happen to be in orbit around another much larger host star. And then the Earth, same thing. The Earth is very, 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 very old. And we have to, I think these astronomers, they they have to stop looking at things by, based on their appearances. Astronomers, I know they're very appearance oriented, but appearances, they can be deceiving. And unless they have the capacity to question those appearances, what they think is true based off of what they measure, and then they look at their own pre-prescribed theories to determine what it is they can see, 
they're just doing themselves an injustice. They have to look at what they're seeing and sort of get rid of their prejudice about what it is they're actually looking at in order to actually solve the mystery. Just don't go looking at the stars and say, well, this is what it is. It's not conforming to my model. Therefore, I have to tweak the model a little bit. No, you have to look at what's there and start over. Look at what's there and say to yourself, well, what am I assuming to be true about what it is I'm observing? If you can't do that first, then no amount of model making, no amount of theory development, no matter of anything is going to work. Because you always have that, that, that wrench in the gears. It's preventing you from making progress. You always are making the assumption true as you plow forward. I guess it's ridiculous as saying, you know, say you have a car and you, somebody had removed the engine from the car. And uh, you try to start the car by turning the key in, in the ignition and it won't start. And the, the astronomer's outlook was like, it would be, uh, well, clearly there's something wrong with the ignition. No, you're assuming the car has an engine in it. There's no engine in there. And that's the problem with astronomy. And that's the problem with a lot of scientists these days is they assume things all the time and then they're stuck. There's no getting around that. And then when you try to mention that their assumptions are what are causing them the uh, their their problems, they get all you know huffy like, oh, how dare you question? How dare you question that assumption? But they don't ever label it as assumption because, you know, once you find the assumption that those are the legs that are holding up the table. Once you kick the assumptions out from underneath the table, the table falls down, and that's what a lot of astronomy is. It's based on a whole bunch of assumptions. And eventually they're going to figure that out, but I don't know. Anyways, I thought that would be a nice, good talk to discuss uh, assumptions and, well, time travel. We can see what the Earth is by looking at the stars, or looking at what Earth was like by looking at the stars. We can and see what the Earth will become by looking at the older planets. We have both. We have both readily available re readily available if we just get rid of the assumptions we have about the world around us all right uh january 4th 2020 yeah i'll take it easy